Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, we're just going to give it a few minutes while you all uh, filter in, and then uh, we'll begin things as per usual. But uh, I know it takes a while for us all to kind of reach the kind of number of participants we're expecting. So give us a couple of moments and we will be with okay. you. As ever, yeah, it's always appreciated to see who is here, sending our welcomes in the chat. I know that's become a little bit of a thing with this cohort, so it's always nice to see those familiar names. I'd make a slow beginning there because uh, some of these first bits are from me and they are less important than hearing from our lecturers today. Um, so I'll kind of begin the preamble since we know it somewhat well. So welcome everyone. And yeah, thank you for joining the, I think the eighth of nine lectures on this virtual PhD course on urban economics in developing countries. Uh, as many of you will know now, but I must say anyway, this course is hosted by the International Growth Center in partnership with the Bureau for Research and Economic Analysis of Development. Uh, so the eight week, eighth week means two things. Firstly, we're nearly finished um, and you are still here, which is quite wonderful to see. Thank you for turning up each week. Um, perhaps it's, you realize you have to get, you know, you're trying to get your certificate or whatever it might be. We, uh, we appreciate it. And it is going to be the last time you're going to hear from me. So a personal thank you. You've been a wonderful and engaged cohort and I've appreciated hosting you these uh, few times. Um, the second thing about the eighth week is that it means we're focusing on yeah, cities, poli uh, politics and conflict, or as we are calling it, the disruptive city. Um, for those of you who don't know me by now, I'm Oliver Harmon. I'm a senior policy economist at the International Growth Center Cities That Work Initiative, and I'll be chairing today's lecture. Um, and to teach us indeed about the disruptive cities, as ever, we are appreciative to be joined by two wonderful lecturers. Uh, firstly, Leonard Wanchagan, who's a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University, and importantly, a member of the uh, Bread Board of Direction by the broad, no, that's a bit of a tongue twister, the Bread Board of Directors. Um, mm -hmm. And secondly, Sandra Sequeira, who's an associate professor of development economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and equally as importantly, a lead academic of IGC's Mozambique. Uh, we've historically worked closely with Sandra as IGC's lead academic, and we are soon to be working more closely with Leonard as uh, indeed the IGC Cities That Work initiative, which uh, that I'm part of. We're collaborating with Leonard's African School of Economics, his new campus in Zanzibar, particularly the African Urban Lab. So if any of you have enjoyed these lectures and are kind of an African-based scholar or practitioner interested in more urban work, I would highly recommend checking out their website and the things that they are doing. So... With that said, brief housekeeping, as usual, be a lecture of one hour delivered in two halves by Leonard and then Sandra, and then we'll have this sort of 20 and 30 minutes of Q&A at the end. We, of course, would welcome live participants during this lecture. This will give you an access to the mic and video and can interact verbally during the Q&A. If you are interested, as ever, raise your hand and Greg will let you into this kind of special panel room where you can join the discussion. Um, we ask you to keep your video on if you are a live participant so that Leonard and Sandra have some people or some faces to talk to or some nodding heads. And as an incentive, I will come to these live participants first for Q&A. For other people who cannot or don't feel comfortable doing that, you can of course type any questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Um, I will be looking at the ones that have been most highly upvoted and coming to those first in the Q&A as well. Uh, these lectures are recorded in this series and they will be available on IGC's website along with the slides and the reading list lists from the lecturers. And as you all know, since it's crunch time, for those who attended at least seven lectures in the series will be issued the certificates as well on, on completion of this course. Um, okay, so that's enough for me. That's my few little minutes. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Leonard to lead off with this lecture. Uh, Leonard, the floor is yours, and I think Greg is going to, yeah, as we indicated earlier, provide you with the slides and provide you with access to them to click through. Fantastic, fantastic. So, yeah, um, first of all, uh, thanks so much for a very generous introduction and, and for the opportunity. So uh, let me start by first saying that it's a topic that for me is for really, really uh, strong 
not only personal, but also academic interest. Uh, I remember very vividly when I moved from a small village in central Benin to the city of Cotonou in 1971. And uh, I was very much looking forward to the opportunity and I made really the most of it, you know. And then later on, um, when I visited Paris in 82 and 83, my world have changed completely, even if it was like three weeks. Um, you know, so so for me, um, cities is are uh, three important characteristics. One is the space, you know, where you have very intense, extremely uh, dense uh, interaction between individuals. Uh, city is also a central place. You know, most cities are um, relatively cosmopolitan, you know, where there is a, a flow of individuals coming in and leaving. And, um, and for those two reasons, you know, uh, cities tend to be more progressive, you know, um, because contact with individuals, contact with, with, between groups promotes uh, liberalism. Uh, city is also economic opportunities, you know, because uh, because of a concentration of population markets, you have investment and investment um, and economic opportunities uh, from investment uh, help um, uh, not only development, but also support, uh, you know, liberal values and, 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 and so on. Now, um, historically, this is the case, you know, like I was, I have been fascinated by Timbuktu compared to other cities in medieval or, you know, pre-colonial Africa, Timbuktu was, for instance, a crossroads between North and South, East and West. And it's not surprising that Timbuktu was probably one of the most liberal um, you know, cities, uh, the constitution of uh, Timbuktu and the um, Mali Empire was very, very liberal. It, you can even confuse some of the aspect of the constitution of that place with current day uh, democracies. You know, more recently, uh, Paris and um, even more recently, El Salvador, for instance, uh, were places where, you know, uh, you know, liberal democracy took roots and developed. Okay, um, next. So um, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to, yeah, what I'm going to do is basically um, to talk about why this is the case. You know, I'm focusing quite a bit on uh, a survey paper by, uh, uh, by, by Ed uh, Glazer. And then, um, Later on, I'm going to focus on my own, uh, you know, historical episode in African history uh, from 1945 to 1960, where cities were the place where the fight for independence were most effective. And I'm going to show that those places that became independent through urban protest, through urban political mobilization, those places are far more likely to be democratic today than those where the independence movement was developed in rural areas. So, so not only um, cities at one point in time can promote democracy, can promote uh, you know uh, development and, and 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 social liberalism, but it's also far more likely to persist and to last because of the mechanism, um, the way uh, interaction, the way uh, economic opportunities develop in, in cities. You know, so, so that's basically uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Next. Um, so, um, so the question is, um, you know, can liberal uh, urbanization lead to greater level of democracy and better government in cities and countries around the world? And it's because, you know, uh, cities help coordinate public action and enhance effectiveness of social movement because cities increase demand for democracy. 
you know. Um, and then what important as well, particularly for governance, is the fact that CD help promote civic capital, which enable uh, citizens to keep improving their own institutions. So next. Yeah, next, please. Yeah. OK, so, so, so there is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are economic benefits, but sometimes social costs to density. The benefits far outweigh the cost. And as I said earlier, is also the benefit of being central, being cosmopolitan, you know. And then um, again, urbanization is, you know, a, a very uh, important driver of uh, democratization, of social liberalism and economic development. Next. So um, let me, next, let me focus first on uh, economic opportunities. You know, I mean, first of all, um, you know, from the, from the worker's perspective, um, you know, work, uh, there are higher wages and that more than compensate for higher cost of living in cities. There is also, um, you know, from a firm perspective, uh, you have the advantage of, uh, you know, higher productivity. So density and agglomeration. And again, as I, I have been saying all along, uh, centrality and connections, you know, between with other cities and the, the larger space uh, makes uh, economy, uh, sorry, make uh, cities the place for economic opportunities. Next. So, um, but obviously, um it there can be uh, in terms of um uh you know uh, human capital uh, it's uh, it's a very very important component you know like uh, in innovation big ideas not only science and technology but also in in um in in economics and social science in general emerge from cities you know so so clearly uh, you have the component of economic opportunities, but with special focus on on human capital. Next, so um, now you know there are costs. You know, you remember during COVID nineteen, you know it's easier to live in to to control the disease in um, you know in rural areas than in cities. But you know there are negative externalities that can be associated, but then with government policy, with proper investment, uh, you know, this can be controlled. Next. So, um, you know, the, the, the point of the fourth presentation is, for instance, how the nature of political engagement in cities tend to be, uh, you know, you know, more, uh, first of all, no, no, more, more effective, but also um, more peaceful. You know, so I'm going to focus quite a bit on that later on in my presentation on colonial Africa. But I think uh, what, what is interesting is that the mass nature of the engagement makes it or less being equal um, effective enough that the use of violence is less necessary, I should say, you know let alone the fact that uh, it's easier, for instance, to uh, to repress a violent, you know, uprising when it's in cities than it is in rural areas. So the cooperative advantage of cities is that not only they promote uh, social liberalism, not only they promote, uh, you, you know, like uh, political liberalism, democracy, but also it promotes a specific, a specific form of expression, political expression, which is like peaceful protest, you know, which is very, very important. Next. So I you know there are you know a lot of historical cases, you know, that uh I'm not going to go through all of this. You know, it's not surprising that the French Revolution, you know, took place in Paris. It's not the case that the, the most important, one of the most important like workers political movement, the Commune de Paris took place in Paris. If you look at the democratization across Africa following the Cold War, 
it's always start from students and mostly uh, university students, but mostly in cities, you know. So, so cities are the place where, again, I'm going to keep saying the same thing, political liberalism, social liberalism, and economic opportunities uh, combined. Next. So, um, you know, anyway, I mean, there are the logistics of running, uh, you know, uprising and running social movements is also far more far easier in cities than in, in rural areas, obviously. Next. Um, so, so anyway, I, I, I'm going to give you, you know, again, as I said, I'm going to zoom in in uh, the example of uh, colonial Africa and post-colonial Africa to show you uh, how this argument play out historically. Next. So, um, yeah, anyway, so it's going to confirm the point that I will be making, you know, more effectively later on, that there is a correlation between urbanization and democracy. There is a correlation um, that not only, uh, you know, is robust, but also it, it's something that persists, persists over time. Thank you. Uh, next. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, let me let me move on, uh, you know, from, from to the example right away uh, for the interest of time. Yeah, next. OK, so, um, yeah, as I said earlier, uh, you know, what is super interesting about um, uh, cities is not only, you know, like the, the space and also the centrality helps ideas that lead to the promotion of democracy and to liberalism but what else what, what is also uh, you know uh, you know uh, interesting to 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 mention is um, cosmopolitanism and uh, people coming and going fluidity uh, in cities it's something that makes cities the place for social liberalism and and a good historical case in point is timbuktu in 13th century you know um what is interesting you can also talk about the fact that um City can be the microcosm of a country. Uh, you, you can have ethnic fragmentation in cities because of uh, ghettos and you know um, ethnic neighborhoods. But then this is not destiny. You know you can actually overcome this uh, limitation uh, by creating space, by creating opportunities for different groups. Um, you know uh, to interact. You know so uh, ethnic fragmentation. Uh, cannot be, can be a problem, but then it can be overcome with policy, with urban policy uh, that help promote uh, collaboration and exchange between groups. Next. So anyway, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, which is something which is very important as individual level, you know, urbanization might promote civic capital, might promote uh, people know each other, people discussing, people deliberating among themselves. And this will make governments better, you know, because policy will be more informed and, you know, reach a set of ideas and that will make governments more effective. You know, if, for instance, you want to promote deliberative democracy, you want to be participatory democracy, it's actually much easier, much effective, you know, in neighborhoods, in cities, you know, because everybody basically lives uh, in a close proximity. You know, there is a recent paper by a colleague from MIT showing how small and very, not I mean, not small, I mean, uh, people living in housing, for instance, not even in the absence of them meeting every day and or every week or whatever and, and talk among themselves, by just seeing each other, by interacting even informally, it can lead to convergence, convergence in collect, collecting towards collective action, uh, convergence uh, towards yeah, in terms of voting behavior and uh, in terms of uh, attitude, you know. So so cities uh, build, um, you know, civic capital, and this can be a major, major uh, driver of uh, governance. Okay, next. So, yeah, I'm going to tell the story of democracy in Africa uh, using these theories or these uh, approaches that I just developed. Next. So um, the, the big question here is, you know, why some countries in Africa, for instance, 
uh, far more democratic than others, you know, like places like Cameroon uh, are not moving, you know, on are not moving on democracy and others like uh, Ghana or, you know, Benin to some degree and uh, Senegal to some degree, uh, those countries were uh, more democratic. So it cannot be income because, you know, the, there are not massive, you know, product, massive GDP gap between those two countries. So uh, modernization theory, which is a possible explanation will be ruled out in the context of Africa. There is also the critical juncture theory, which says that, well, something happened, something happened in the past that led some countries to be on a path for democracy and others on the path of autocracy. And that's the critical juncture framework. Next. So, um, you know, uh, the modernization theory, as I said earlier, focused on, you know, human capital development and the critical juncture theory talks about events, historical events that led country to be on a path or another. Next. So, um, next, I already explained it. So what, I, what this study have done is to show that, strangely enough, but what explain much of divergence in development in Africa, sorry, in uh, democracy in Africa is how those countries became independent. So countries that became independent through like rural rebellion, you know, like Cameroon, like, um, uh, you know, like uh, Kenya to some degree and uh, Libya, you, those countries are more likely to have to be autocratic, but countries that develop, um, sorry, that has urban protest as form of independent movement, they are more likely to be democratic today. You know, like particularly the case of uh, of Ghana, you know, and to some degree South Africa. And then, you know, uh, when you look at the, the slide, you'll see the methodology that we use uh, to prove to prove uh, causality. Next. So uh, this is the map to show how diverse, I mean, if you see Latin America, so you see the Americas, the Americas are by and large democratic, Asia by and large autocratic, but Africa you have divergence. You have a lot of heterogeneity in terms of regime type. Next. So, and, uh, you know, again, this is particularly uh, strong. I mean, the div the gap between the two set of the, the, between Af between African countries in terms of democratic uh, reforms was was very strong after the Cold War. Next, so um, you know to to see a bit of a to 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 for for, 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 for to, um, to understand the background better, you, we have to look at uh, political development in Africa post World War Two. Post World War Two, um, you know. Uh, colonialism was discredited, had, and there were a lot of protests, a lot of um, kind of rejection of uh, colonial rule, but it took two forms. You have Western European style socialists that were pushing for more peaceful uh, reforms, to put, I mean, peaceful reform of the colonial uh, regime, and others were radical Maoists were pushing for violence, you know, particularly in places like Kenya and, and Cameroon. Next. So, for instance, the proponents of uh, peaceful protest were Nkrumah and uh, Nyerere, that, you know, from this quote was clearly basically uh, uh, showing their strong commitment, you know, to, to peaceful protest as the only way, only effective way. Uh, to be to, for for uh, for African uh, countries to effectively um, fight and get fight the colonial regime and 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 become independent next. In contrast, Franz Fanon and and others, they were making you know pushing for violence as the way you know and they justify violence as the fact that violence is a way to um, it, it's effective because of its effect on those 
on the oppressed, because when the oppressed is violent, then you get self-confidence, gets respect, and so on and so forth. Next. So, and um, the fact that these strategies depend in part on terrain, on the geographic conditions of the place is explained in this quote by Amerika Cabral. What is interesting about Guinea-Bissau and Cap Verde is that, you know, this is the one place, I mean, this is the two places, I should say, Guinea-Bissau and Cap Verde, led by one movement, you know, uh, PIGC uh, in, in the French acronym. And then, but they were using more peaceful protest in Cap Verde, but using violent tactics in 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 um, in Guinea Bissau, with the effect being today Cap Verde is far more democratic, and uh, Guinea Bissau uh, more for more autocratic. You know, so the 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 the, the, you know, the example of uh, Guinea Bissau Cap Verde show really how important you know. Um, and how effective uh, peaceful protest, the culture of peaceful engagement uh, can be um, not only in the short term, but also in the long term. Next. So the, I'm, not, I'm going to skip the theoretical argument. You can uh, read it uh, from, from the slide. Let me go, okay, those are pictures. You can see example of insurgency. This is Kenya and next South Africa. And then to see how this um, works out, this is uh, protest in Egypt in 18 to 1910. And then um, the, you know, basically the Egyptian revolution. The, the, the only difference between the two is that one is black and white, the other one is colored. Otherwise it's a replica of the past. So obviously, you know, Egypt is not the most democratic country in Africa, but it cannot be because of the culture, it could be because of other factors, you know, that explain this. But I mean, anyway, the point I wanted to say is that there is persistence in form of engagement, you know, in, in when people are used in one place to do something, it becomes part of the culture and it has, it can have long-term impact. Um, you know, next, you know, Libya, for instance, you know, Libya was violent then, uh, violent uh, under Gaddafi, and violent today, you know. So next. So um, for this, I use uh, the data set on, on, on insurgency um, across, uh, you know, insurgency across Africa, uh, forms of independence by coding uh, archival kind of information from, from, the, from the colonial rule um, and from the, you know, the, the form of independence, you know, and we use other, you know, data from colonial times and contemporary, uh, uh, you know, data, economic data, e economic on, on economic variable like population, income, and stuff. You know, we use also terrain because terrain here is a very important factor because terrain basically dictates, can dictate the form of insurgency. You know, what I'm meaning that ideas of real rebellion might be more prominent in places where real rebellion ge are geographically uh, feasible and possible. Next. So, and, uh, you know, we code independence movement this way, violence or rural rebellion, uh, sorry, violent rural rebellion or uh, urban protest. Next. And this is the map. This is the, the map of Africa, you know, um, based on the form of independent movement. Next. And, you know, this, th that's it. This is uh, basically uh, the result the ex of the exercise. You can see that from 1960 uh, to the Cold War, um, there is a sense in which, you know, urban protest countries were more democratic than rural rebellion countries. But this gap between the two set of countries were but much bigger, much significant after the Cold War, you know. So it is interesting because it just shows you how also the Cold War as an external factor repress the emergence of democracies uh, in those countries. Even though countries that have a culture of engagement that are peaceful, because of the Cold War, they were 
less likely to be democratic. But anyway, so it's interesting to see that this gap between uh, countries, um, you know, with real rebellion and the others, that uh, this gap has really um, uh, not only uh, emerged in 1960, but persisted over time and became much bigger um, post uh, Cold War, post 1989. Next. So, and this also matter for development. You know, you look at GDP per capita, the countries that were urban protest countries, they have higher GDP per capita than those that's a rural rebellion, you know? So just also link, you know, it's a, another way to link uh, democracy with uh, economic development as well, you know, next. So, and, you know, the association we see, we use, um, you know, many statistical methods to show, uh, you know, uh, the association between the two, next. And, uh, you know, we did uh, diff and diff, you know, um, to show the same results, next. And, uh, you know, those are the first empirical strategies, you know, the results are robust and confirmed, uh, next. Same thing, you know, confirmed. And later on, next, later on, we, 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 ne next. So we, we use um, different methods to show the mechanism. The two mechanisms we look at, one is norm of behavior and institutions. So for instance, like a country that have urban protest, um, is it because the institution that they set up um, post-independence were not were less zero sum in a sense like, you know, they will have more inclusive institutions as a result of being a urban protest countries, you know, as in contrast, countries that have real rebellion, they will be more exclusive because the winners or the leaders, the military uh, leaders um, of the rebellion, when they take power, uh, they will, want to consolidate power uh, because they have a stronger sense of, uh, you know, because they, they basically they earn the right to rule because of, because they were, you know, because they, they, they you know, because, um, because of the, um, you know, the, the military tactics uh, that they use because of the cost. You know, while if you take country that urban protest, for instance, is more inclusive, we need the mass, you need a mass to win, you will my need a mass to, to, to rule. And as a result, urban protest will lead to more democratic norms. So that's one, institutions. And then the, the, the other channel could be normal behavior, you know, meaning that movement that happened pre-colonial, um, so during the colonial time, those will be the norms of engagement will be transmitted post-colonial. And as a result, uh, these, these norms would, um, would lead to, you know, strike as a most, let's say worker strike, as opposed to coup, it will lead to, you know, um, you know more moderate response to provocation as opposed to extreme response to provocation. I have one example in mind. A friend of mine, for instance, um, was telling me a story, you know, in Ghana, where he was saying that um, when, you know, uh, was a regime change, very violent, a um, lot of military leaders and uh, were arrested and many people were killed. And he remember very vividly uh, a meeting where his dad was a politician, had with others opposition uh, members, and they were making, they were deciding what to do in face of the rising violence and repression, and they reached the conclusion that they need to set up a newspaper. You know, in other contexts, it will be let's let get Libya and the Soviet Union to give us guns, and we'll move to the mountains and start fighting the government. But the reaction on the spot is not that. It's like, well, because they have. The, you know, when you are in the face of repression, in the face of attacks from the government, even military government, you know, a reaction that opposition leaders will have in those places might be different. 
than other places. Take Kenya, for instance. You know, in Kenya, you can see, uh, you know, things turn very violent very, very quickly. You know, even protests against, um, you know, co living conditions recently led to several dozens of people being killed. You know, this happened very commonly everywhere. But then the way the opposition mobilized, the strategy that they use, I think is part of the culture. You know, it, it's a very important concept because for instance, is also a way to get us to assess the risk, political risk. If you look at the, the nature of independent movement in the place, you can have a sense of how likely it is that this place will go to sink into political violence. You know, next. So, um, you know, I think this quote is very, very important. It's a quote by 19, in 1967 by uh, Nyerere, who was basically saying, why are we not going to use violence? Because the kids are watching, you know, like basically, if we do something now, the kids are going to learn from it and do it as well. And then before we know, they are doing to get, they are going to do it against us, you know? So, so if you want, um, you know, you, it's, it's very important, you know, to maintain this, culture of peaceful engagement with government because not only it's effective and this is more likely to happen in cities but it it kind of help kind of maintain or develop a culture of peaceful engagement that help hold the country together in the in the long term you know so this is very important next so, you know, I mean, this is how we show it We're using some mediation analysis and showing, and we find that the most important channel, the most important channel is cultural channel, not the institutional channel. Why? Well, because many of the institutions that set up post-colonial were um, copy and paste, you know, from, um, from, the, from the colonial, from the, from the institution, I mean, from the constitution, I should say, of France and the, the British. So if you look at the constitution of Benin or constitution uh, compared to the one of Cameroon, for instance, in 1960, there might not be much difference. But even though, you know, Benin is a urban protest countries and Cameroon was a rebel, uh, you know, like um, a rural rebellion country, you know. So, so culture is the key. You know, I remember, you know, for you, some of you who might know, um, you know, when I was uh, in, in high school, you know, I was one of the leading, um, uh, one of the leader of the pro-democracy movement in the country. And, um, you know, I, I remember that we had a, you know, it was a bit height of political repression against the movement. And I was, you know, I was, I was fleeing around the country, um, you know, try to hide from, uh, from the police and from military police. Many of my friends were arrested and so on and so forth. And I remember we had a meeting and, you know, and people were saying, well, you know, it's time for us to take charge. You know, we need to move. We need to, you know, Mao have said this is how to do it, you know, and so on and so forth. And then, you know, and then one of my, I remember vividly one of my friends say, where are the mountains? Where, where are you going? Where, we will find you tomorrow. You know, so, so the way we rule out Mao immediately is by saying there is nowhere to hide. You know, so we just stay in the city and then move from one place to another. And, you know, I remember also that, I, you know, there were, I had a protest, you know, it was a major protest against the, the military government. And, um, you know, there was some kind of uh, exchange between students and the police. And, you know, and one of the overzealous students actually got the gun from the police and it came to say us come came to us we were in hiding and he said oh you know we are we we you know we, we, very interesting now we have we have uh, you know and i was we, we told him no way first of all they should put it let's find a way to give it back to a police so that they do not be, they do not even think that we are preparing an armed rebellion against the government you know, so, you know, I'm not going to go through the details, but that's what we did, you know, and say so we, we were so highly committed to show that, and part of this is not just because there were, there were no mountains in the country, nowhere to hide, it's also because we thought about 
you know, leaders of the independent movement. One of them is called Louis Hunkari. He was, I mean, he was, he was like Gandhi, super committed to peaceful engagement. And we learn from it from generation to generation. So this is very important. So, so I will leave it there. And then um, the quick summary that I'm going to give is that cities are the place for economic opportunities. Cities are also the place for um, the development of liberalism and democracy. And the, 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 the channel is through uh, social connections, you know, the centrality of cities in, 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 a, in, a, in a, any given country, but also the proximity, the density of interactions between individuals help develop uh, these values. So that's, that, that's one. And what is important is that once it's happened, it lasts. And the example of Africa is one of them, you know? So that's why commitment to nonviolence, uh, which is a value that grew up in cities, it's super, super, super important uh, for not only for growth, but also for growth and development, but also um, for democracy and for liberalism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leonard. Um, I'm not going to provide any thoughts or tidbits for now. I might hand straight over to Sandra. Sandra, yeah, let's hopefully the um, screen sharing will work. So I am seeing these kind of slightly odd boxes again. Um, yeah, I mean, they don't, they are only kind of captured part of the slide. So if you prefer uh, to have control. Um... Yes, yeah, so we could, we could do that. We could, okay. I think if Greg could give me control, so I'll stop sharing. Okay, good. Greg, is that possible to get Sandra's slides up and provide her control over your screen and hopefully these little boxes will go? Just a second. Thank you. Um, and then Sandra, yeah, it'll be half an hour again. We started a little bit later due to my little preamble, so, um, and I was very much enjoying Leonard's uh, stories and vignettes to, to, to add some personal flavor to that wonderful uh, empirical research. So uh, good. OK, this is clearer to me. So Greg, if you uh, can go back to, to clicking, if possible, and Sandra, yeah, just oh, yeah, let Greg know. Um, can I have access to clicking or? Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, that was what we were going to do, Greg, if you can. Yes. I haven't done this before, so. Sorry, <laughs> okay. the new, so I'm experimenting. This, Zoom has updated its settings and it's slightly yeah. thrown off some of the uh, sharing capabilities. So, right. so uh, it's a groundbreaking presentation, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, let's see if this, uh, you can I control? I'm not sure I can show. Uh, a request has just been sent, so you should. It has, uh, but it doesn't allow me. When I try to change the slides, nothing happens. So, oh, can you try now? Yes, perfect. Okay. So it's working. We're back on. Sandra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, and well, thank you so much for this invitation to to share my views on such a, an interesting topic. I've been working with the IGC for many years, but um, the, the possibility of having this platform to try to persuade you that doing research on the political economy of urban development is an incredibly exciting area for future research. So Leonard already identified several issues um, that I will be just very briefly touching on as well. But I wanted to start by just setting the stage with some motivating facts. Again, this is something that you um, might have seen already in the course of these series. But just look at the, the pace of urbanization in low and middle income countries in the last 60 years. So um, we see that starting from a very uh, low base of about 12%, that the rate of growth has been of around uh, 25 percentage points. Now, to keep this in perspective, we could perhaps look to Latin America. So for instance, Sub-Saharan Africa right now in terms of urbanization rates is similar to where Latin America was about 60 years ago. But the pace of growth of the urban population is way faster. So Sub-Saharan Africa is growing at 200 
uh, percent in the last 60 years, whereas um, for Latin America, this was about 60 percent. So there are obviously many interesting lessons learned from the Latin American case, but just to keep it in perspective, just the, the rapid urbanization that several um, parts of, uh, of the developing world are facing these days are incredibly challenging. So uh, what I'm going to try to do uh, in my lecture is to try to make the case for how how this rapid urbanization can be managed and the importance of applying a political lens to it to try to understand the type of governance challenges that this rapid urbanization can create. So I'm going to very briefly mention some of these issues that have already been addressed in other sessions of these series, namely uh, the enormous pressure that rapid urbanization creates on public service delivery. And so what are the implications for local governance, talking about creating municipal taxation systems as well. Um, but then in the second half, what I'll do is I'll try to do a deep dive into an area that I think is particularly relevant for low and middle income countries, which is this complex relationship between urbanization and conflict. So specifically, I'm going to focus on how conflict can drive migration to cities and so influence this uh, trend in rapid urbanization, but also how the structure and the dynamics of cities can either mitigate or amplify uh, social tensions and unrest. So starting with uh, public goods, so rapid urbanization, and this again has been mentioned before in these serious places, enormous pressures on developing, but also on maintaining adequate infrastructure, ranging from housing to transport to waste to sewage. Um, again, these issues have been mentioned and in several occasions in these series, uh, other lecturers have mentioned also the political lens on how important it is to understand not just the level of investment in public goods, but also how access to public goods is controlled in an urban setting. So um, we could perhaps take a, um, an historical perspective here and think about the urban political machines, which were these highly organized urban groups that uh, go back to the building of the US in the 19th and 20th century that relied heavily on patronage, on community loyalty, on reciprocal uh, social services to try to maintain power and try to influence and shape local governance. So things like public jobs and contracts were always awarded in exchange for votes and for loyalty, which were often secured uh, through a strong either ethnic or neighborhood ties, particularly in uh, immigrant communities. So um, perhaps the, the better known political machine was uh, Tammany Hall in New York, which were in fact in power from the late 1700s up until the 1950s. So, so on the one hand, these political machines kind of helped what would have been otherwise very marginalized communities, namely as a, of immigrants, getting access to jobs, to housing, to legal protection, and creating this loyal um, voter base. But these machines were also associated with pervasive corruption, with some voter manipulation, um, and overall just lack of transparency in, in governance. So while there could be several clear parallels that one could try to draw uh, when we think about urban politics in low and middle income countries today. So we might think of informal workers who are particularly dependent on politicians to access uh, jobs, to access public services in the slums of Kenya, Brazil, or, or India. And so this creates a dependency that politicians can then exploit through vote buying and giving just selective access to some of these public services, particularly following the electoral cycle. So again, on the short run, this type of clientelism can uh, provide some uh, short term stability, but it kind of undermines the broader development of what are the transparent and effective um, structures of governance that are needed for long-term growth, and they could also entrench segregation into cities. Now, one of the critical differences that I'll mention between these political machines in the US, the historical political machines, and what we see today in the, in the developing world or in low and middle income countries, is the fact that the US political machines were operating within a much more established state structure, um, whereas this type of clientelism and ethnic politics in low and middle income countries 
is now often occurring in uh, environments that have less institutionalized political frameworks. And so that is likely to, to have implications for the overall process of development and growth. The second key area that I was going to highlight for research, uh, I want to spend too much time on this because Leonard did a, a great job in covering it, but it's the importance of protests and public uh, mobilizations. So there is evidence that the cities can facilitate this type of collective action and the effectiveness of, of civil movements. There is a bit less evidence that cities can increase demand for democracy and that they can lead to higher civic capital. But I think this is precisely where um, more interesting work uh, uh, could be done. So it's, it's definitely an open area of uh, research. Now, another important area for research um, on urban politics and the governance of cities is to think about uh, how to develop municipal PAC systems. Um, so this is key to be able to fund this increased investment in, um, in public services and public goods. And But we need a much better understanding of what type of uh, governance structures are needed to facilitate these investments. And so Agustin told this a couple of weeks ago that you know, using local chiefs for enforcement of uh, local property taxes that um, could be conducive to uh, expanding the taxation base. Uh, there's other research that looks at the importance of political rotation of politicians to try to disseminate industry-specific knowledge across cities um, from China. There's some evidence from India that looks at the number of politicians per jurisdiction and how that can introduce more checks and balances uh, in the system that is then associated with less regulation and more firm entry and economic growth. Um, so there's a lot of active research. And I think this is, again, another area that is ripe for more work to be done to try to understand what exactly are the, the political structures that are needed to be able to de deliver on these municipal tax systems in an effective way. Uh, the last point that I would mention was to think about the medium to long-term implications of expanding the municipal uh, tax base and municipal taxation capabilities more broadly, because as cities start to become more financially independent, this could um, lead to some political instability because it might reshape relationships with central governments, it might strain these relationships. And so it's important to think about the political economy of the long-term development of municipal taxation systems. I think that's another uh, incredibly interesting angle of political economy to apply to urban politics. Okay, and so now I would turn to uh, cities and conflict. Now, as you can see here uh, from the graphs, there's limited evidence that um, conflicts are necessarily becoming more urban over time. In fact, fatalities in cities are much lower than fatalities in, in rural areas. So what are the key issues, though, that lie at this intersection of cities and conflict that would be interesting to do research on? So conceptually, uh, cities might on the one help, help on the one hand help diffuse conflict. So there's some earlier research by Ted Miguel showing that urban dwellers are more likely to embrace a national identity. If we take um, more recent data from, this is from the Afrobarometer, from one of the most recent uh, waves, and when asked, do you feel more belonging to a particular national identity than to a particular ethnic group, um, urban dwellers overwhelmingly will identify more with a national identity. And so this offers um, some hope to try to overcome the downsides of ethnic fragmentation in, in cities. Um, there's a second dimension, however, that uh, through which cities can help diffuse conflict, because as conflict tends to hit primarily rural areas, um, rural urban migration, and we see here, when I talk about migration, I'm talking about movement in general, because when we think about displacement uh, due to conflict or due to climate change, we see that over 50% of those displaced are actually in cities. So this, on the one hand, can serve as a relief valve if there's conflict uh, hitting rural areas. On the other hand, it could also represent um, a movement to opportunity to places with higher human capital. People may acquire higher human capital when they move to cities, and that can lead to occupational shifts that then underpin structural transformation. So 
what I'll try to do now is to do a deep dive into one of my papers that tries to illustrate precisely these dynamics. So when conflict here hits rural areas uh, and it induces this type of rural urban displacement, so what happens to those displaced and what happens to the places that they're displaced into? So uh, just conceptually, our starting point for this paper, and this is joint work with uh, Giorgio Chiovelli, Stelis Michelopoulos, and Elia Papayuano, is that conflict could lead to significant disruption costs. So it's possible that those who are displaced are then less likely to invest in, in education um, at destination. There's this massive disruption in their lives due to displacement. An alternative hypothesis is that um, what has been called uprootedness keep, kicks in. So this idea that if you are displaced, you're more likely to invest in movable assets as opposed to physical capital. And so education is the prime uh, movable asset that displaced individuals might prefer to invest in. So this is another cha channel that could lead to increases in human capital. And lastly, the fact that you know, cities offer uh, other opportunities, labor markets are going to be deeper, deeper, and so returns to education are going to be higher. And there is some evidence of this from the Chetty and Hendred work, um, even though most of this evidence comes from peaceful times in, um, in high income settings. So in this paper, we try to see what happens in the context of conflict in a low uh, income country. So to do so, we're focused on the case of Mozambique. And uh, we examined the uh, protracted civil war that lasted between 1977 and 1992. This came in the heels of another independence war from Portugal that lasted until 1975. So this is a colonial independence war. Um, just the basics about Mozambique to help us understand and interpret some of the results. Um, Pre-war employment in agriculture was very high, so it was about 90%. The share of rural households was about 85%, and years of schooling were extremely low. Now, an important characteristic of this conflict is that it affected primarily rural areas. There were some skirmishes in cities, but it was primarily in rural areas that most conflict events took place. So what we do is we try to leverage um, a census that was done in 1997. So this was five years after the end of the war in Mozambique. And uh, we take advantage of this census because it allows us to, granted that very coarsely, to try to identify the displacement paths during the war for the universe of the surviving population, so about 12 million individuals. So the census tells us where people resided at birth, where they were right before the war ended. So we take that as the place they were displaced to, and then where they resided later on after the war, so in 95 and 1997. And this allows us to create this displacement matrix to see um, how people were displaced, what were the trajectories that they followed, and then to try to focus on uh, two key outcomes, which would be uh, their level of investment in education and their employment after the war. So if there were any occupational shifts that went hand in hand with the changes in education levels. So just to give you a sense of the general statistics for this case, so about 1.2 million people were internally displaced in Mozambique during the war. Uh, the majority of them were displaced into urban areas, and amongst those, most tended to go to the three largest cities of Maputo, Beira, and Nampula. Most of the sample that we're going to focus on is going to be individuals who in 1997 were between 12 and 32 years of age, because these are precisely the individuals who were making schooling decisions during the war. So this will be our sample of, of interest. So what do we find? This is just looking at the universe of the population. And we can see that in blue, we have their schooling outcomes. In orange, we have the uh, employment outcomes, so five years after the war. And in the left panel, we have those who were born in rural areas. Okay? And they could follow three trajectories. So they could be externally displaced into neighboring countries. They could move from rural areas to urban areas, or they can move from a rural area into another rural area. So for those who went into neighboring countries as refugees, we don't see any changes in investments in education uh, or any changes in employment uh, after the war. 
Okay. While most refugee camps had functioning schools, um, our interpretation of this one possibility is that people had very limited incentives to invest in education in refugee camps. This is a phenomenon that still occurs today um, as there are no labor market opportunities and, and so uh, children have less of an incentive of going to school. We see, however, a big jump in schooling for those who moved into cities. And that goes hand in hand with leaving agriculture. So an occupational shift primarily into, into services. We see somewhat of a bump for those who go from rural to rural, but really the big one or the most uh, impressive change is for those who moved uh, into cities. Now, that was just correlations, obviously, using the universe of the population of Mozambique after the war. So we tried to sharpen identification. And I wanted to here tell you a little bit more about the methodology because, you know, this is a somewhat intractable uh, issue to try to solve. We were working with very limited census data. It was a historical event. There are no surveys, nothing that would, we could rely on. And so um, we tried to consider many different empirical strategies to allay concerns related to, is this just selection that some of the better people with the more motivated are the ones who are going to move into cities or not? And so uh, what we tried to do was to apply uh, a mover's design. So this is following the Chetty Hendren methodology to try to exploit the age at move of each individual as something that is exogenously determined by the timing of conflict, and then to see if those who, mo who moved at an earlier age are then more likely to be exposed to the better environment for a longer period of time, and that results in more investments in schooling. So again, uh, if you're working in this area of migration and displacement, you know that we have usually very limited evidence on when people move. Uh, and so to try to get around this, we try to create a bound, sensible bounds on what would have been the age at which each individual in our full census, our full sample, um, had moved. And so we made a couple of assumptions. We started by, well, the household, each household that we observe in the census relocates together. Now, then we looked, exploited the year of birth of the different siblings and taking advantage of the fact that families were quite large um, at the time to try to see the year of birth of each sibling and how that could help us bound the age of move. So if we take the birth year of the oldest individual who was displaced and was already born at destination, so that's kind of the, the latest at which the family could have moved because that individual was already born at destination. Um, the earliest relocation of the family is going to be the birth year of the youngest member of the family, so the youngest sibling, who was born still in the district of origin. Okay. So that's going to give us a bound of when the family must have moved, given the timing and the location of birth of each of the siblings. And then we just take the midpoint of that, we throw out um, uh, windows that are too, too wide, uh, and we focus primarily on individuals who relocated between the ages of 1 to 18. So then we just um, apply a straightforward um, movers design where we look at the delta, so the difference in uh, human capital okay, in places of destination and places of origin. And we see um, for each individual, given the age that they moved, how the years of exposure to places that are of higher human capital, how that affected their own investments in human capital. Okay. So um, here are the results. And when we look at all districts across Mozambique, uh, what we see is that if you moved at a very early age, so you're more likely to have invested more in schooling at destination. So this starts decaying. What matters here is the slope is to show that moving at an earlier age has a bigger impact. But what this methodology also allows us to back out um, is a level of selection that might be driving some effect. So if we zoom in to individuals who moved between the ages of 15 and 18, these are individuals who were not going to go back to primary school at destination. So whatever education they had, whatever human capital they had, this was an investment that was done prior to the move. And so this gives us a measure of selection when we look at the full sample. And so how much is selection and how much is just the exposure effect of being in cities? We then start restricting the sample. And so if we focus here on the bottom panel, 
we're looking at districts of high conflict. So these are the ones where displacement is more likely to have occurred due to conflict. And also when moves happened within just a couple of years of a major conflict event in that district. So here we're kind of trying to zoom in uh, into conflict-induced movement. And interestingly, we see that um, even if you're being pushed out by conflict, uh, the earlier you're pushed out, the more you're likely to invest in education at destination. And here, selection is closer to zero. So no matter, during conflict, everyone gets pushed out, right? So in the first panel, perhaps we have a mix of people who are pushed out to, to conflict, but you'll have economic migrants as well who are positively selected on education. Uh, but here in the bottom graph, we have mostly people who are just, everyone gets pushed out and everyone seems to benefit. Uh, from moving to a better place, from moving to cities, they all invest more in education. Okay. Um, we then do a third uh, kind of empirical strategy, which is trying to exploit family variation as well. So comparing, looking at a family where the different siblings follow different displacement trajectories. Often in the chaos of war, these very large families would get separated and one child would go with an uncle to one place uh, or with a cousin to another. And so we exploit now within family variation, which accounts for um, you know, family level characteristics, such as the uh, level of human capital of the parents, their networks in the different places and so on. And controlling finally for gender, whether the sibling is a firstborn or not, we try to see does this hold even within um, family. And, and again, we find very similar results to what we had in the, the first set of correlations where there's this big jump in schooling for siblings who ended up in cities compared to siblings who ended up in any of the other trajectories of uh, refugee camps or other rural areas. And that goes hand in hand with a decrease in the probability of being employed in agriculture after the war. So finally, to try to understand what are the mechanisms. So how much of this is just driven by cities just being more conducive to investing in education? And how much of this is just the uprootedness effect? Is that just because you were uprooted, now you want to invest more in a movable asset like education uh, as opposed to physical capital. And so we try to decompose these effects. So controlling directly for differences in human capital at places of destination and places of origin, and then using looking at the residual of that as this measure of uprootedness. And so what we find here is that um, both mechanisms are at play. So we find evidence of both uprootedness and these coefficients are statistically significant and different from zero, but the bulk of the effect is driven by place-based effects. So it's moving to cities, moving to environments where you have deeper labor markets and more incentives to invest in education. Now, uh, this is kind of a silver lining of um, forced displacement and conflict is that people get redirected into cities, they invest more in human capital, but this still raises many issues and many questions. So one is whether these educational gains of internal displacement are long lasting. Um, how do these internally displaced individuals um, compare to urban born who were never uh, displaced? And then obviously trying to understand, are there any downsides associated with this type of um, forced displacement into cities? And so to try to answer these questions, we ran a survey in one of the largest uh, cities in Mozambique in northern Mozambique. This was a city that, in fact, doubled its population during the war. Uh, and we tried to see, you know, is this comparable, the, the sample that we have in the survey with what we find in the census? And we see that it is, so average years of education are quite similar between the two. Uh, now we have an opportunity to ask people directly, so when you were displaced into the city, uh, why did you invest more in human capital? And the majority of them will respond that it's because we felt that some education was needed in order to be able to access the labor market. Um, so that's one of the advantages of running these surveys. So we also ask those who were displaced during the war. So this is today. So the survey was done uh, three years ago. And we ask how do they compare in terms of their levels of education to their siblings who remained in rural areas. And so we see across the board that those who were displaced uh, invested much more in education compared to their siblings who stayed in rural areas during the war. 
when we compare them to the urban dwellers who were never displaced, so they were living in cities throughout their, their lifetime, uh, we see that there's convergence. So actually those who were displaced achieve similar levels of schooling as urban dwellers. They're more, they're equally likely to be employed in paid work. There's a bit of a wage penalty here. So they report lower wages. And perhaps this is one of the questions and open questions in our paper still that would be interesting to try to understand better. But there is overall convergence on education and probability of employment. But when we start looking at other indicators, in particular indicators related to trust, social capital, civic attitudes, we see that those displaced don't perform as well as urban dwellers who never experienced displacement. So we observe lower levels of trust, um, lower levels of political participation and civic attitudes, and this is despite achieving convergence in terms of education. When we look at mental health, we also see a penalty here. So those who were displaced 30 years after the fact and after the war, they still report low levels of mental health compared to uh, urban dwellers. So just taking stock, what this paper is trying to do is to show that this rural urban migration, even in the context of forced displacement and conflict, can lead to higher investments in human capital and to important occupational shifts that can underpin structural transformation, that there might be social costs in the form of lower levels of mental health, a lower trust and lower civic capital uh, as well. There are many open questions still. So understanding with this rapid pace of urbanization that is fueled by these types of displacement due to conflict or to climate change, what are the general equilibrium effects? So what are the effects also on uh, urban dwellers who were not displaced? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, trying to understand what is what lies behind this wage penalty for um, those who are internally displaced into cities, and then trying to understand can this long-term trauma from conflict uh, or other types of displacement be reversed. And here where I think there are a lot of policy challenges that can try to focus on how to integrate these populations in, into city to preserve social and political stability. Very quickly, lastly, so this was the first set of hypotheses of cities can help diffuse conflict through these different mechanisms. But of course, it's also possible that cities can exacerbate conflict and social tensions. Um, they're often hotbeds of political revolutions. There's the rapid expansion of social media. So Leonard already mentioned some of these issues. And there's also some social tension that comes with ethnic fractionalization. And so uh, it tends to be the case that urban dwellers uh, have lower levels of trust, less social capital uh, than others in rural area. There's also the very salient competition for resources in urban environments that can lead to zero sum mentalities that make people less willing to share uh, to share resources. So this is, again, just motivational. It's data from the Afrobarometer, most recent wave. And, and we have here just a coefficient on whether you're an urban respondent or a rural respondent. And we have several interesting uh, measures of these dynamics. So one of them is whether if political participation, essentially, whether in the last year you have been involved in solving any problems in your community, um, uh, how likely are you to have information on public services that is important for local governance, uh, and then do you, how much do you trust other citizens? And we see that by and large, urban dwellers tend to um, report lower levels on, on all dimensions, with the upside that I mentioned earlier, that they also tend to associate more with a national identity as opposed to an ethnic identity. For zero sum, this is an issue that I've been working on um, for a while now, is, is just this belief that the gains of one group come at the expense of another group and how this mindset can affect, can frame economic and social relationships across groups and affect people's attitudes towards policy. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data on zero-sum thinking in low- and middle-income countries, but, um, but we have from uh, the World Value Survey some evidence that suggests that in low and middle income countries, people to then tend to be more zero sum in their thinking. So they tend to view the world more as a competition uh, uh, to try to access very limited and very scarce resources. We can't really break this down into urban and rural, but just on average, the level effect is different when compared to, um, to middle income countries, namely. So, so I think this is a set of issues that we're tr still trying to understand how these cultural um, mindsets 
can um, can affect social and economic relationships in urban environments. So I'll close off by saying that I think this is a, a fascinating, incredibly exciting area of research. I think there are many open questions that need to be addressed. We need to understand the nature, the dynamics, and the implications of urban politics for the provision of public services and how that then affects urban development. We need to better understand the direct and indirect impact of conflict uh, on cities and importantly, uh, try to understand how issues of culture and identity can also help sh shape urban development. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Sandra. I very much uh, enjoyed that as well as Lennis. Yeah. I mean, I'm supposed to because I put it together, but uh, no, that was really wonderful. And I'm really glad that we brought this kind of urban political economy angle to the kind of urban economics module, because I think it's sometimes left out. But I think what we've heard today shows that it is you know, vital and there's a lot of interesting evidence. And indeed, I appreciate a lot of those open questions you also shared, Sandra. I think um, that was very useful and a uh, good kind of food for thought for many of the scholars on this uh, call. Now, I don't want to start a digital revolution. So as promised, I will come to those live participants first. So Abdul Karim, I think uh, if you do have a question, I will open the floor to you um, first. But while you think of that, yeah, I just want to say thank you, Len. I, I really like this kind of contact, centrality, cosmopolitanism. There were lots of Cs, convergence, and the Cold War. I think there were, it was, and this kind of mixture of quotes and causality was really wonderful. And Sandra, similarly, this kind of, use of yeah, Afrobarometer data to really embed a lot of this. Uh, yeah. and, and indeed the census itself, I thought it was really powerful. And I particularly was thinking when you showed us that urban dwellers with their national identity, feeling more aligned with national identity, I was thinking back to what Leonard was saying, the kind of urban dwellers and their peaceful protests. And I would love to see that data back in the 1960s when some of these independence movements were um, taking place. So, uh, and yeah, Afrobarometer indeed, I wanted to shout that out as the data source I use a lot in my own work, and I think it's powerful as a starting base for a lot of questions. So, with that little pre-postamble, let's say, Abdul Karim, I don't know if you have a particular question. If you, please raise your hand if you do, and if not, I'll I will go to the um, ones that I, uh, are the most upvoted, which was my other promise. Um, so, I'll start with that one for now. So, there's, there's two that I think particularly, um, caught my interest and indeed caught the the interest of the rest of the group one particularly because it's front of mind i've just come back from egypt at the world urban forum in Tahrir square and uh, Assad ali khan is asking here how do initiatives focused on regenerating public spaces e.g squares and parks influence kind of violence reduction conflict de-escalation and security improvements um so i think there's something there about like the urban realm and uh, how yeah how we can kind of change well, yeah, violence, conflict, uh, and security, um, particularly when it's integrated, they ask with kind of other socioeconomic measures around education, transportation. Um, and then there's another nice one that's kind of come up a couple of times from Ariga and Endal Kachu, who's kind of asking a little bit, so, so you can take either one of these questions as you desire. Um, this kind of asking for your perceptions and your views about the kind of large city bias model in African politics. So a lot of, I think, this primary city bias that we sort of hear um and they and i think also there's this kind of secondary follow-up question which is related and how kind of maybe systems of governments and um governance and sort of decentralization interlinks with that so looking at kind of federalism based country government structures and how cities interact and how the power is there versus kind of more unitary systems of government um there so we'll, we'll start with those two and then we'll move on um i don't know if there's uh yeah leonard we can hand the floor back to you and you can answer one and then Sandra, you can see if you want to ask the other or uh ask uh answer as either you prefer leonard you're on mute um so two things very quickly um so first um i would like to you know i'm very like glass half full um so and you know uh, looking at my own trajectory, you know, I think the opportunities that cities offer is just massive, massive, massive. So uh, we should be, I think for me, we should be focused on government failure in taking full advantage of the opportunities that the uh, city offers. You know, like for instance, um, you know, like we need cities to be a vibrant cultural space. 
We need cities to be a vibrant place for science and technology development. We need, you know, uh, cities to project ambition, to project drive, you know, and this is very, very important. And then, as I said earlier, um, the opportunities to run the country, to run the, the city, I'm sorry, run the city better exist because of proximities. So then cities should be managed in a very deliberative, very participatory manner, you know, and all these things I'm talking about have proven to be effective for development, effective for conflict re reduction. And the cost of doing that is actually lower in cities than elsewhere, you know? So because of uh, concentration and, and also, let, it, let alone, for instance, the, um, the, uh, the investment opportunities, bigger markets, FDIs, and, you know, if you want to set up a tech hub, you want to set up, uh, you know, major, Kind of development investment, it's easier close to the cities or in the cities than elsewhere. So um, I think that's why I'm so excited to be part of this initiative to uh, to set up the you know African Urban Lab so that we can think forcefully about these issues. You know, we can we can say what do we do? You know, now in terms of urban bias, um, I think um, one of my former students. Um, uh, Harding, you know, from Oxford have shown that we are moving towards more like rural bias. So things are leveling each other out, you know, because uh, 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 cities, people living in cities tend to be pro-opposition. So as a result, they are not, they are not like, you know, they are, they might be, have been penalized because they support opposition. They are troublemakers, you know, while in, you know, in, in rural areas, it's easier to get people or to support the government in place. So again, the political economy dimension of this is about, you know, we can promote more programmatic, more public policy oriented politics, and it's easier in cities than in rural areas. I done an experiment in Benin where I see, you know, it was the 2003 uh, World Politics paper where I show if you want to appeal people to people's ethnicity, clientelist appeal and general public policy kind of appeal, which one works better? And I find that the only place in the sample that's more urban, more cosmopolitan, that's the only place where the opposition messages were better received and also people were very more supportive of public, public policy messaging, which is not very surprising because in that place, people see the country. They don't see they see the country more because they have seen more countrymen, you know, people coming and going, they're cosmopolitan, contact, this kind of stuff. So again, um, we uh, there is opportunity to use this, you know, to promote um, a more inclusive, a more programmatic, public policy oriented um, kind of um, uh, uh, politics. And this is more, I mean, this is easier probably in, 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 in urban setting. And I take uh, Sandra's work um, along those lines and say, well, this is what we have. This is how this is how far we are from the frontier. So how do we make, how do we make politics? We make investment in such a way that we get close to where we need to be, that we use cities to its full potential, you know? So, and this is, you know, I think the message that I would like to uh, propose. Thank you. Yes, I would jump in to to second that and um, to add a, l a little bit of, of flavor to it. So uh, again, uh, Leonard was saying that he's a half full uh, glass type of person. I also see opportunities everywhere for research. So I think these are two great research questions uh, to pursue in the future. I would just say that this idea that contact is important, so creating public spaces for people to come together and interact. Um, so there's an extensive literature looking at the contact hypothesis on how bringing people together, majorities and minorities, and interaction and face-to-face -face interactions can actually result in more social cohesion. I think the evidence is actually quite mixed. And in fact, I have some work done on that as well, not in the context of cities, but showing that People are very attuned to their own financial circumstances and their own feeling of financial security and how contact can, at times, if you feel financially secure, 
can enhance relationships, economic and social relationships. If you don't, it can just exacerbate tensions and conflicts. So um, I think the important learning here for cities is to think not just about the infrastructure that allows for this contact to occur, but always bearing in mind the fundamentals that uh, if people are not feeling financially secure, that contact with others who are different and who, if there's inequality, can actually lead to more instability. Um, and so it's important to think about both dimensions. And in terms of the urban bias, uh, I agree with Leonard. I think we need a lot more understanding of um, what are the implications, what is the extent of urban bias, what are the alternative models that could be pursued. Uh, for instance, maybe there is a capital bias, and it's not just urban, uh, but there are many um, smaller towns and smaller cities that could develop enormously. There could be positive spillovers from the larger cities to the and uh, to the smaller cities, and and so I think we can kind of think more broadly and more creatively about how to manage uh, development on, on all fronts without necessarily being constrained by these initial set of models and urban bias, so. Wonderful, thank you, Sandra. Speaking of bias, I often feel that we bias towards the questions that come in early because they get upvoted. And so there are two that have come in late that are related that I just think I'll touch upon that are directed to you, Sandra. And they both kind of speak around the same thing, which is I think the role of land. And um, so a couple of people are saying they're very happy with your presentation, which is always good, um, learning about their countries. But like, what is this access to land as a factor in the kind of development of rural to urban population? And how have you analyzed it? And what is your kind of perception on that side of things? I don't know if that question is specific to the, the case that I discussed in Mozambique. So maybe that when you move to cities, you lose access to land and, and that's why you invest in education. I don't know if that's what the person was trying to get at, but obviously that would be a very uh, important point. Now, in most of these environments, individuals often, even when they move to cities, engage in this peri-urban type of agriculture where they do have access to land, um, we don't see that happening with the with individuals who were forcibly displaced due due to conflict. So we see that what displacement did to them was this gift of mobility. So it kind of pushed them out and forced them to rethink their trajectories. And, and so that naturally led to an exit from agriculture altogether. In fact, we see more than that. We see that even for those who returned in about 20% of the full sample of Mozambique at the time, 20% of individuals returned to their places of origin in rural areas after the war. And we see that they still don't go back into agriculture, even when their families still had access to land. So the fact that they acquired more of an education, it really changed their outlook, it changed their skills, it changed their motivation. Um, and so that's what we think is, is happening here. Is And it's, it presents an opportunity for many countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, where you have 80% of the population in several places still in agriculture, um, that pushing people out into cities presents this opportunity for reskilling and for increases in human capital that can be important for structural transformation. So um, so we don't think that access to land here really was the main uh, driver of these effects. Right. Yeah. And sorry, that was with respect to Capto Delgado. So exactly uh, where you were speaking about, which is why I thought it was directed. Um, wonderful. I think I'll probably have to close now. Um, there are many more questions and indeed we'll try and save them and think about how they can also influence the International Growth Center's kind of future research, future research direction. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Huge thank you to our speakers. This is like a wonderful public good that they provide us, um, sharing their insights and it's really appreciative. And yeah, also thank you for the audience again for your wonderful, insightful questions. They make me question a lot about my own work. Um, and yeah, also thank you for being here after eight weeks. I mean, we've had like similar numbers each week, so we're kind of happy that people are sticking around. Uh, and indeed, yeah, we look forward to seeing you all hopefully next week for our final week together, uh, where we have Matt Khan and Ziki Cheng, who's gonna be talking about uh, sustainable urbanization or as we're calling it, adapting the city. And I think for one, it will be a good one. So thank you very much and hopefully see you next week. Thank you. And Thank it will be so great much. to have the questions if we can have them so that we can maybe engage with the participants and people who ask those questions. We can do exactly. that for you, Leonard. Wonderful. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.